that is what will be the topic of our lecture tomorrow. Nice story. Thank you for sharing. Yes. Right. Based on your earlier response, I just want to know to what extent has casteism played in this and how in the wake of the information and technology period that we are living in with a lot more people getting education, has casteism become irrelevant or is it still one of the major obstacles or who can share some thoughts on I think it is both, the role of what is caste, you know. Unfortunately, I mean, we don't even have a word called caste. The whole idea behind it, see, first thing we have to understand, every society has certain hierarchies. That doesn't justify it. But what I'm saying is, this is something we have to understand. So the ancient Indian hierarchy was, before it became obsolete and uh, exploitative, a system that became defunct and stopped being relevant to the changing times. The ancient Indian division of labor was made on the basis of everybody pursuing moksha as the final goal in life. It was made so that everybody would feel secure that their place in life was already there in a certain sense. So that they didn't have to fight for something in the competitive market. It was a totally non-competitive society. That was the idea. Now all ideas don't follow in the same way that they are intended. Times change. And also the division was not based on birth. You know, as we see in the Bhagavad Gita, Chatur Varanyam Maya Srishtam Guna Karma Vibhagashaha Guna and karma. Guna means a certain coloration. What is the coloration? Certain predilection towards certain things. If you make somebody who hates to administer anything, you know, some kind of a managerial position, they're going to hate it all their life. They're going to be miserable. Some artist type, you make them into some kind of a red tape bureaucrat. It's, it's a very sad thing because their talents lie somewhere else. So this was a, supposed to be a process of self-discovery to see where you fit and there was a lot of lateral movement as we can see from the saints called the Nayan Mars. 60 of them, I think they are venerated. You see them in front of the temples. Sages. And, and so guna means a certain predilection based on the body-mind-sense complex that one is endowed with, and karma, the, the jobs. That is what it was based on. It was not based on birth. But as the system became little more strict and patriarchal, this became much more entrenched. And it is something which is very defunct, very exploitative. And, you know, uh, I think has it, ch has it changed now? Of course it has changed. First of all, it's illegal. But that doesn't mean that the scars of the, the discrimination we do not see in the world, we do see that. And we have to do everything in our power to help that along, yeah, to help the situation in every which way we can. Next question. Yes. On a similar comment about cars, uh I have a little short story to share on one of the flights that I was on, you know, one of the Delta representatives, she asked me, you know, when I said I was in India, how is the caste system prevalent over, you know, and uh, my answer was, it's very much the same as what we are experiencing in this flight. Yeah. And she was like, what do you mean? She said, you know, just like you have medallion and silver medallion and platinum, can a guy from a regular gold class get into the medallion and, you know, pick the line? No. Yeah. Initially, based, you know, it's not based on birth, it's a classification based on the number of miles you fly. But it's the ability to transfer that privilege onto the next generation and, you know, who feel that they have the right to enter. So, these are all societal pressures and everybody evolves around these concepts and it's just a way of intellectually, you know, evaluating each case. Well put. Yes. Only. Uh, following up on uh, Narayan Swami's initial question, I mean, you know, I have not 
uh, talk particularly about uh, about Hinduism, all religions have dogmas, and when you look at some of these uh, mythological stories, uh, there are certain things which clearly conflict with uh, scientific evidence. So when you are talking about that to your children, uh, how would you present that to them so that they think that we are not trying to fool them or tell them a lie? And now you won't have any problem, children or grandchildren, because after Harry Potter, every, anything goes. <laughs> <laughs> Flying wizards, parallel universes, invisible cloaks, no problem. Yeah, now it's very easy. Yeah. Hari Puttar, somebody has made a spoof on Harry Potter. <laughs> Hari Putra. Next. Haji, Bolye. Swamiji, uh, could you elaborate a little bit about some of the work that Puja Swamiji is doing? He's doing a lot of work for helping our Hindu sampradaya and protect it and at, at the very highest levels. And not many people might be aware of some of those activities. He, so if you can help us understand that and what we can do to... Yeah, and that would be a good sequel for you to talk on in for Siva also. <laughs> Perfect, yeah. Very clever he. Wonderful. <laughs> 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 I didn't mean it this script. <laughs> very well. Segway, you know, the Segway is very artistically done. You have to appreciate it. <laughs> I like that. Very nice. So, Punchi Swamiji has done the impossible, you know. And he always says, this is something about, this is the, 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 the beauty of the Hindu tradition according to him, is that it is a tradition, it is a religion with many popes, he says. In every other religion there is one pope and you have to wait to get some, you know, certificate. You are hereby declared a saint and you know, this is long after the person is gone. So many things you have to, it's all very centralized. Here the beauty of the tradition is this, in its decentralization, in its manifoldness of all the paramparas and the sampradayas, there are all the lineages which, can, which can, do not see eye to eye. You know, coexist happily. In fact, in the same life, in Haridwar, you have this whole ashram life. And the religious leaders will never meet because they don't, they cannot see eye to eye or anything. They will, even if they meet, they will sit like Navagrahas, you know, the Navagrahas. <laughs> <laughs> the nine planets when they are represented in the temple, they should never face one another. Very ingenious people. <laughs> and so the religious leaders in India were like that because until recently, not see eye to eye on anything because you know you are this and I'm that and I come from this gharana and this sampradaya and you are from that sampradaya and Shaivism, Vaishnavism. What Puchi Swamiji did was transcend the differences. This is what he does best. Transcends all the differences and sees the oneness. And he was able to see that he was able to understand that the call, you know, the call is something beyond these small, small differences based on hermeneutic, hermeneutic interpretation, the ontological interpretation of the Vedas. So he constituted the Acharya Sabha of all traditional Mathas, ancient, you know, lineages, schools of looking at the Veda. At least they should have been in existence for 150 years, that was the criterion. So first, a group of disciples was sent all over India to see who these people were. We didn't know. They lived in caves. They lived somewhere underground. One of the mathas was literally underground. Koteshwar Math, it is somewhere in Madhya Pradesh. Nobody even knew. But there is a whole thriving uh, ashram there. So like this, they were brought into a fold of a loose body of scholars, thinkers, respected leaders and it doesn't matter what they believe because here it's all about transcending the belief and looking at the similarities. And I'll never forget the first Acharya Sabha he gave a talk and that was one of the best outlined talks which 
elaborated the fundamentals of the Hindu tradition and it was done so beautifully that nobody could object. He talked about dharma, he talked about ahimsa, he talked about everything being sacred. He talked about how the individuals relate in terms of vak tapas, in terms of swadharma, everything. It was just a flawless, nobody could find fault with it. He received a standing ovation from these acharyas who would not even, you know, acknowledge anyone else. It was amazing. And that set in motion a series of reforms because the acharyas were not just sitting idle. To their credit, they were already engaged in a lot of helping, you know, Samaj, Seva, everything. Every ashram has a certain kind of a help, helping wing. But now it was all brought together out in the open. So many things were discussed. The, the, the bodies were strengthened. This is one of the very important uh, uh, contribution, among, one among many. And even on the world plane, he has founded several organizations, the World Congress of Religious Leaders. He wrote the charter for that. Again, when you look at it, it's just amazing. And uh, one lawyer read it and he said, Swamiji, which utterly drafted it? <laughs> Puja Swamiji himself had drafted it. It was so beautiful. And like this, he also upholds a, a number of works and, uh, you know, I'll let you talk about the Chhatralayas, but Aim for Seva has got a lot of other outreach, like uh, helping the uh, local forms, art forms, the dances, music, uh, fabric, so many textiles, so many kinds of art forms. And supporting these Oduvars, you know, these... Uh, uh, traditional singers uh, in the chanters in the Shai Shiva temples. And I have a nice story to tell because I received a letter from a woman Oduvar. Only one. She wrote, she said, I have passed the exam like everyone else and uh, I am paid less than the men. Why? I said, just wait, I'm going to forward your letter to the correct person. <laughs> I forwarded it to Pooja Swami. Pooja Swami said, which temple? Quickly tell me, I'm going to look into this. This was a year ago. So like this, it is a very beautiful thing. A lot is happening in, in so many areas. Then there is, then there is an organization called Dhar Dharma Samstha Pramukh Sabha. This is for the new offshoots of ancient Mathas, you know. And in fact, Arsha Vidya, Chinmaya Mission, all these come in this only. And other, you know, traditional uh, ways of teaching under new banners. So those are also there in the Dharma Samstha Pramukh Sabha. And uh, so like this, uh, on many, many areas, and he has done so much, there is the Tirupati Declaration. You have to read this, it is so fantastic. Where suddenly some obsolete uh, uh, Edict was taken out from the British Times, and it was said that you know the even though it says Sapta Chaleshwara said the Lord of the Seven Hills, they said the five hills don't belong to this. And there were some plans to build some mosques or, and churches there that was you know reclaimed back. And then there was this what is that that bridge? Rama Setu. Yeah. And that Rama Setu has been declared a national monument, that little strait between India and Sri Lanka, where NASA pictures have clearly shown an underwater bridge that has sunk because of the times. This was crafted by all the Vanaras and the chief monks and everyone. <laughs> everyone. This is something sentimental. And just to save some petrol, you know, the, the ships passing there and destroying them, there's no need for that. So many years they have not gone, so many centuries, why suddenly go now? And that was also put a stop to. And so this way, there was a, and, and this is possible only because he has the backing of the, all the Acharyas. He is so highly respected because his actions are extremely appropriate. 
when we have an acharya sabha meeting he will be sitting at the at the level you know floor level and have the acharyas all sit above on on big chairs to so this kind of way the way he conducts himself is so appropriate in every situation this is something for all of us to continue to learn just by watching we can learn and so this way there is a lot of unity coming together for the good of humanity for the good of uh, hindu dharma so much going on and of course aim for seva with the whole student homes and this is because in rural areas the schools are far away few and far between and one lady asked swami ji i please build some homes why don't you have schools yes we have schools but between the school and the and our hut there is a forest and we can't send the children to school because they may be wild animals it's dangerous so when the homes were built next to the school so that the children could stay there during the week or during the school year a nutritious food and all is given people are donating land and everything so the idea is to build one school uh, home in every district there are 630 something odd districts and at this point i will ask ishwar to ishwar and shobha to talk about this little more she wants to sing she will sing after that one minute here One minute, okay? Can you wait? Yeah. This this uncle here badly wants to talk. <laughs> I certainly am not the politician that Sarvaji was. Yeah, it was very well done. I like you. I appreciate it. I'm appreciating that. Fact, fact, Sarvaji was one of the best uh, marketing directors for Aim for Seva. I think most of you know about aim for seva in case there are a few of you who may not be familiar with aim for seva i can uh, tell you a little bit about the movement that pooja swami ji started in the year 2002 but last year around this time i remember in august uh, when sadhvi ji had come for a lecture here and uh, we were getting ready to sell tickets and introduce aim for seva to georgia and atlanta for the very first time and she said just bring the tickets over here and i'll distribute it to all the attendees here so she inspires me each and every day for you know getting the best for the children and the uh, poor children who need the education from us who are the privileged class to the underprivileged class uh, in rural and tribal india so you i don't more prasad to distribute this time no <laughs> no no see we've done a program in 2013 as you probably know i'll just take a few minutes and it's probably close to 9:15 here but yeah. just a few highlights about what has gone on so far since uh, we introduced aim for seva in 2012 to atlanta and georgia we already had our we had we do one fundraiser each year and we performed our annual fundraiser in the year 2000 in april this year and we had a wonderful uh, um, you know response was fantastic and between the number of people who chose sponsors children and what we have pledges for the rest of the year we are close to 110 child sponsors and as you all know it takes about 450 dollars per child per year in each one of these uh, chatralayas for the children to be educated i happened to visit one of the chatralayas when i was in india in may and it was a phenomenal experience i couldn't see the children because it was summer and the kids were all away in, in their homes but uh, we are now close to 108 chatralayas in fact that celebration is going to be held in february of uh, 2014 Uh, in chennai and there is going to be a lot of people coming to celebrate that magic number we should But, all go yeah i think we should all definitely if we are all going to be there I'll certainly take the time to make that uh, trek to chennai for celebrating that but in the works is more than 108 i think there's a lot of people in this community who are also building chatralayas so my appeal to all of you is spread the word out for info seva in your own way with your friends and when we have an annual program this is the core group that i look to for helping in terms of uh, making the program a success so i appeal to each of you to help in making the program a success in fact i was told in 2014 we are ha- already having a nice program in the works uh, uh, there's a in fact a program being put together called meghaduta and a couple of very well known dancers 
are going to be doing the choreography from Chennai, and the music is going to be set by uh, Bombay Jayashree. So this is just a privy to this group out here, but more in the works. So that program will be probably held sometime in the August September time frame of 2014. So other than that, the other things we are doing is since we are close to 100, 100 student child sponsors from Atlanta, one of the things we are looking at is we can adopt at least three or four chatralayas from each one of these 108 chatralayas as part of Atlanta. So we could probably have one from the south, one from the east, one from the north, and one from the west. So we're working on those concepts so that we can say this particular chatralaya is going to be, the children from here is going to be attached to the Atlanta community. So that we can have a connection between the chatralaya and the kids and our community. So these are all some of the things that is happening. I'll, I'll keep this group informed with all the child sponsors by sending out some information soon. And the other thing probably, probably Shobha might want to talk about is every December there's a group of uh, youth that is being taken to one of the chatralayas. In India, this time there's a group going from Michigan and a few people from uh, Atlanta itself to Madhya Pradesh. And Shobha will talk a little bit more about it. So if you guys have any folks have any questions about AIM for Seva itself, please let me know. And we are still taking pledges for child sponsorships before the end of the year. Yes, Thank sir. you. No, all over India. All over we, India. We've got 108 chatralayas across 15 states. Yeah. So it's right from Karnaprayag in the north, right down to Kanyakumari. There's chatralayas in Gujarat, in Madhya Pradesh, which she'll be attending Karnataka, to in Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh Bihar, Orissa. Bihar. The, the goal is, the vision for Puja Swamiji is to have one in each and every district in India. And we hope that she will get past the 200 uh, number of chapter lands by 2020. So we still have another 400 to go, there's 600 districts. So. Now this auntie wants to talk really badly. After that you can Sorry. see, okay? Sorry, yeah. Gia, Sorry. Yeah. Just, just two more minutes. Quick. Yeah. And I just want to add to what Ishwa mentioned about AIM for Seva. Uh, the children now uh, from these schools are uh, reaching the age where they have graduated college and some of them have even gone on to post-graduation education. If you have come for any of the AIM for Seva events, you would have uh, noticed that. Um, we have many children who are coming abroad and got a lot of scholarships in Canada and the United States to study. And um, we have many students such as those amongst our midst and we hope to um, form a group of youth who would um, then pass it on to the coming generations and they would be the advocates for AIM for Seva and poster children for AIM for Seva in terms of spreading the word and uh, encouraging all of us to be part of it. Um, so in lieu of that, I am helping um, Srini, who's a national coordinator for AIM for Seva, on a youth trip. He puts on this trip every year and has done it for three years now. This year, I'm going to be helping him be the chaperone for the girls and joining him on a trip in December for the children to visit Chatralayas, to work there, to um, get to know how a Chatralaya works and to see firsthand how the children in Chatralayas and how, what their needs are and just to bridge the gap between the youth here and the youth there so the youth here can give back to their uh, you know, community in India. So um, if you would like to know more about it, I can tell you more about it. And if you're interested in sending your children probably next year, this year's session has uh, pretty much been finalized and the tickets bought. So I'd be more than glad to take your names and uh, talk to you more about it. Thank you. What age group is involved? What age group is um, Pretty much high schoolers, anywhere ninth grade and above. And up to college level kids. We have Very to, nice. I'm we glad have to, you're going. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, we have two sophomores from college joining us on this trip as well. Now you have to give it to them. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Shobha. She almost got up. Come here. Come here and see. Today's yeah. her birthday. Today's her birthday. The birthday girl. Come here and see. Yeah. Bring the mic. Bring the mic. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Yes. See, even the people here can see. Yes. Wait, it's what, yeah. <laughs> you can see yourself, you can see yourself sing also. Come on, sing. Manamali Govinda.
Hari Narayana Govinda Hari Narayana Govinda Basta Pradya Mandara Panukoti Sundara Basta Pradya Mandara Panukoti Sundara called pot. And the pot 
is not opposed to space. Pot cannot trap space. Space is free. Space is that which accommodates the pot. Pot cannot, you know, say, I am suddenly become the accommodator. Remember our definition of space. What was our definition of space? That which accommodates. Avakasha pradatra akashana. So there is nothing that accommodates like space. If pot is accommodating the space, it's a condition, it's the, it's the condition. It's a conditional status. And it's an as though accommodation because really speaking that which accommodates is space. So really speaking, for the pot space to quote unquote merge with real space, so to speak, there is no necessity because they were never separated to begin with. Yeah. You don't have to go like this for the pot space to please come out, merge. There was never separation. The separation is in the alienation. If supposing the pot space has a human mind, it will definitely have a complex. Oh space, space Bhagavan, where are you? I want to become one with you. It will have the complex break. Let me shed these mortal coils of clay. It will be saying like this. In order to merge with the whole. But here there is no coil, nothing. It's all that, that there is this space. And if you put an as though divider, like sometimes you know they have these accordion divider between rooms, you know, in these big, big hotels and all that. You just fashion the so called space, but really speaking, it's not, you cannot trap space, like you cannot trap Brahman. So that which is not separated to begin with, there is no need to unify. That which never was separated, what is the need to unify? So that's what I would say in response to what you said. So really speaking, and then if you transfer that allegory to the jiva, the image to the jiva, so the jiva to become one with Brahman does not have to break or to, you know, the jiva hood has to be lost and that is transcended cognitively. That's enough. To say that jivatvam is a superimposition upon that free atma. Jiva hood is a status, just like that pot space is a status, a mere conditional status and as though status which is an impermanent thing. So if I know that, then even with a limping body I can say I am Brahman, I can say I am limitless, I am free enough to enjoy a limping body, I am free enough to have a mind that most of the time says never mind, I am free enough to have senses that don't make sense. This is, this is wonderful. So this is what it is. It's a cognitive transcendence rather than some kind of a separation and uniting. There is no separation. And this is what, you know, there was a question, somebody was asking Bhavati and all. This is what Bhavati says, this is avacheda vada. The as though conditioning, which we accept, Shankara accepts that. That is one way to look at it. And the other way is to say that this is a reflection, a reflected conscious, Pratibhimba Vada. That is Vivarana school. So this is what it is. So these two things, both of them have their problems. But we use, we have to use some imagery, otherwise how to understand this? We have to take it selectively. That's what it is. Any last words for tonight? <laughs> Any last question? Yes. Swadharma and Paradharma. Swadharma is what you are supposed to do. Paradharma is what you are not supposed to do, what someone else is supposed to do. Their Swadharma is your Paradharma, really. Yeah. How do we define that this is the role? I mean, do we really fall into our role that this is where we, 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 we perform our responsibility? It would be nice if it came with a script, correct? Yeah. If everybody had a little script like the children in the play, it would be wonderful. If you forgot your lines, you could look at the script. 
sorry, not my role, somebody else is you, your role. Unfortunately, we have to make up the script as we go along. And sometimes you have to pick up the lines for other people, we are supposed to say it, but they don't say it. You have to say it. The show must go on. Shakespeare said, somehow in a way, Shakespeare said a lot of Vedantic things. <laughs> and in one place he said that the, all the world is a stage and men and women are but actors, players. So this is what it is. So you're an actor. You didn't start this show, so you cannot stop the show. The show must go on, you have to do your part. And what is the part? You, have, you mumble, fumble, grumble and find out. That's all it is. <laughs> And then you get to a place of, you know, first you want to do only as you like, but that being impossible, you get to the place of liking what you do. That's, that is Swadharma. Learning to love what you do is Swadharma. So when uh, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Swadharma Nidhano, yeah, Nidhanam Shreya Paradharmo Bhaya Bahana. Was he referring to the religion or was he referring no, to no, Krishna? No, no, no. Yeah, your own mind. Swadharma, very, you know, I was talking about this at an interfaith conference in Milwaukee. And they said, what is Swadharma? I said, Swadharma means mind your own business. <laughs> I told point blank. It was very nice. I felt good saying that. <laughs> because that is what it is. Because we don't have time to look into other people's businesses because Swadharma really means do what you're supposed to do. Paradharmo, bhayavaha, even if it's imperfectly performed, even if I'm fumbling, mumbling, grumbling and having all kinds of doubts about my own dharma, even imperfectly performed, it is what I'm supposed to do, I'm comfortable with. I'm still, you know, writing the script, enacting the script and I'm comfortable with this, correct? Paradharma, I don't even know the, play, the, the playing ground, the playing field, what is there? So therefore, I don't mind into other people's business. I mind into my own business. That is what the idea is. Because always the, the grass looks greener on the other side. Somebody else's job looks lighter. Oh, how come they don't have this, I have this. But then actually when you go intimately and see that, then you feel like what you were doing it was better. That looks like from frying pot to fire, you know, yeah. So therefore, the, you know, the impetus, the human impetus is to avoid discomfort and seek comfort, correct? Yeah. As we saw even on the first day from all the chair huggers and the wall huggers, I, I made a comment, yeah. That's the human tendency to seek comfort and avoid displeasure. This is the natural human tendency. But just because it's a tendency, that doesn't mean one has to give in to it. Because otherwise when the going gets tough, what happens? The tough get going. The so-called tough get going. So Bhagavad Gita and in fact the Upanishads don't, uh, you know, don't uh, prescribe flight. Because flight means aviveka. Flight means impulsiveness. Flight means not thought out proper, you know, it's a reaction rather than a response. And when you run away from something, chances are that karma will have the last word and it will catch up with you in a different form. So why bother? Starting with marriage. You know, you run away from one marriage and then are you happier in the next marriage? No, there are a lot of similarities, the same kind of spouse. Because generally that's what happens. You run away from the job, the same kind of uh, boss comes in a different form. You run away from the house, this actually happened to some people there. I was invited to a satsang and uh, they lived in, really in the boonies, somewhere in Colorado. I said, why have you built a house here? There was nobody there. They said, no, no, we were actually in Denver. I said, then what happened? Denver is a nice place. Why are you here? No, we had these neighbors that were very annoying. All the time they were having remodeling projects. Dum, dum, dum. They were, you know, banging something and they were just, you know, some, uh, all these drilling something constantly. We were tired of it. So we just moved up, took out all our things, packed up everybody and moved to this remote location. I said, are you happy here? 
said, no, the plot right next door. <laughs> and started to construct soon after the movie. <laughs> so karma has the last laugh. That doesn't mean that the Bhagavad Gita or the, or the Upanishads say that you have to be passive. Whatever you can change, by all means change. We are talking of things that cannot be altered are submitted to the altar of surrender and acceptance. In the process, you are altered. That is what we want. That is the whole idea. Whatever you can change, please change. They tried, this couple tried to change the house. They got changed, that's all. Yeah. Oh, you had a question? Om Sarve Bhavanta Sukhinaha Sarve Santa Niramaya Sarve Bhadrani Pashyantu Akashchit Dukkha Bhagbhave Asatoma Sirgamaya Tamasoma Jyotir Gamaya Mrityoma Amritam Gamaya Om Pur Namadar Pur Namidam Pur Nathur Namadachate Om Nasya Pur Namadarya Pur Namiva Shishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Shri Guru Bhyo Namaha Hari Om